Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first History Highlights series of 2021. I'm glad to, to see you all here virtually. My name is Annie Black. I am the Director of Programs and Volunteers for the museum. Just a couple of things before we get started. First of all, I wanted to thank our community partners for tonight's event, Legacy Senior Communities, Temple Emanuel, and the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. As always, we very much appreciate your support of the museum and our programs. Uh, we very much encourage questions during tonight's program. If you wanna go ahead and locate your Q&A button, if you are on a computer, it's likely at the bottom of your screen. If you are on a tablet or mobile device, it might be towards the top. So at any point, if you have a question during the program, please go ahead and feel free to type that in. We will save plenty of time at the end of the program to get those answered. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to start with an introduction from Dr. Sarah Avos Jacobson, our Chief Education Officer at the museum, followed by uh, the featured presentation from Felicia Williamson, our Director of Library and Archives. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Sarah Avos Jacobson. Sorry. Sarah? Oh, I'm, here. You I'm here. I just, <laughs> okay. sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm um, paying attention to grammar. I noticed my name was misspelled and, and even better everybody, I misspelled it. <laughs> so I just corrected that. So I, I'm feeling better. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, tonight for this exploration of one of the really unique collections uh, that we have had the the incredible good fortune and opportunity to bring into uh, our archives uh, in the past uh, few years. This is the Harold uh, Pullman collection. And before Felicia gets into the details of the collection, I wanted to give you uh, just a short uh, overview of Mr. Pullman's uh, really uh, remarkable early days and then and then uh, Felicia will take you uh, into uh, more of his story. So the reason he is so interesting to me as a as a historian of, of, of Jewish history and culture is that he comes uh, from he was born in North Dakota and North Dakota uh, had a small but thriving Jewish community by the 1890s. Uh, we don't think of the Upper Plains, Upper Midwest as being uh, full of uh, thriving Jewish communities, but in fact, North Dakota was. Uh, in uh, the 1890s, North Dakota had at its peak a Jewish population of about 1,750 people. Uh, they were scattered between Fargo, uh, Grand Forks, Minot, Devil's Lake and a, a few smaller communities. And their history in some ways mirrors the history of Jews in other areas of the United States, including Texas. And so I just wanted to very, very quickly review a little bit of that history. So the Jewish community in uh, North Dakota gets started uh, in the actually in the 1880s. Most of those people who come to the Dakotas are fleeing persecution in Eastern Europe. So they're Jews coming out of Romania, Russia, what was the, the Empire of Russia? So it includes everything from Lithuania to Latvia to, to, to Ukraine, as we would we would think of uh, the area today. And by the 1880s, a Jewish community begins to form in in Grand Forks. Now, the reason it's interesting is because a lot of the Jewish community that arrived in North Dakota initially arrived as peddlers and homesteaders. And you actually had Jewish Orthodox homesteaders from, from the Empire of Russia out on the North Dakota uh, plains and living in sod houses, homesteading, dealing with those really tough winters. And I say that with serious appreciation for that for tough winter having grown up in Buffalo uh, myself. So what happens with the Grand Forks community is that by the 1890s, they have enough Jews to open a synagogue. It is an Orthodox synagogue that they open up. Uh, they have several families that come together and fairly soon thereafter, 1891, they, they are able to bring in a rabbi, a, a gentleman named uh, Benjamin Papermaster. And this community is a, a thriving small Orthodox Jewish community. They have a synagogue, uh, which cost them 
uh, $3,000 to complete uh, and uh, was completed between uh, 1898 uh, and 1905. It sat on the corner of 2nd Avenue South and Girard Street in North Dakota. They have a burial society or, or Hebra Kadisha as, as it's known. They have a B'nai B'rith chapter, which is a fraternal order. They have women's chapters. They have a Bible or Torah study for, for uh, children. Uh, they have they have they have really a, a very active little community, and as part of this little community, if you go to the history of the synagogue that they opened, it was called Congregation Children of Israel. That little synagogue has a list of the um, former members and founding members of that congregation, Children of Israel, which ultimately became B'nai Israel and still exists to this day. It was Orthodox today, it's Reform. And if you look at the list of early uh, members of that congregation, you find two names on it. They include Paul Pullman and Sally Pullman, the parents of Harold Pullman, who is our subject uh, for tonight. So they have a history that, that goes back uh, in the Dakotas to the previous century. Now, there is a, a volume that was uh, written about uh, Americans and their connection to land uh, in, in, um, in the US by a woman named Anne Macklin. And there is a section in this book, the book came out in 2006, there is a section in this book about the Pullmans. And specifically, uh, it is about uh, uh, Paul Pullman. And it talks about him coming over from Russia, settling, uh, stopping first in New York, uh, meeting his wife, uh, Sally, in New York. Uh, she had connections to uh, a um, cousin who lived in Minot, North Dakota. And by 1910, uh, we know he's in the US and slightly later than that, uh, Mr. Pullman and his wife have moved to Minot, North Dakota and they have gotten involved in the fur trade. Um, his activities in Minot are uh, briefly uh, interrupted for World War I and, and Paul Pullman actually serves uh, in World War I as his son does uh, in World War II. And he opens up a, what becomes a successful fur business. His son, Harold, uh, who was born in North Dakota, uh, becomes very, very well versed in his father's uh, fur business and fur trading business. Uh, there are descriptions about uh, at the age of 11 or 12, Harold driving trucks full of fur uh, that, uh, you know, pelts on, on deserted uh, roads in North Dakota and working up to 11 hours a day uh, for his father. And it just is an interesting juxtaposition because that's a very, very lonely life, that part of it. But the Pullmans, including Harold, were very connected to the small Jewish community first that existed in, in, in um, uh, Grand Forks, later that existed in Minot because there was a, a synagogue that is opened uh, in Minot as well. Uh, if you look online, you can see the 1940 uh, US census and Paul Pullman and his wife, Sally Pullman show up there as do their son, Harold Arnold Pullman, 15 and daughter, Laura Pullman. At that point, they're listed as living in Carrington, uh, which is uh, an area called Foster, North Dakota. And the reason I, I wanted to share this with you is to give you a sense of the fact that although this seems really kind of removed from us in Dallas and from what we know in terms of Jewish community and larger community, in many ways, they were very, very uh, similar to us and the reasons that Jews came to Dallas and settled here. Um, and uh, with that, I want to turn this over to Felicia to begin to explore this really incredible collection. Well, thank you, Sarah. I'm so glad Sarah was able to explore that with us. 
um, any time for me, I get to learn more about uh, Judaism and also an, an unusual aspect of our nation's history. And certainly the fur trade in North Dakota was not something I knew a lot about before I started learning about Harold Pullman's history and, and his own recollections of his youth are really fun to read about. And so um, it was something new to me. And so thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint now and we'll start talking about this really interesting collection. Let's see. Okay. So Harold Pullman was born in North Dakota. Um, the collection we're gonna be talking about today came to the museum in 2015. In fact, uh, Sarah worked with the family to bring the collection in and picked it up. It's a, one of our larger collections. It's got over 400 items in the collection. Um, it's really the story of his World War II service as a B-24, um, a radio operator. And as an archivist, we love the kind of guy that Harold was because he was a keeper of things. Um, it, it, you know, you might call him a little bit of a hoarder. And I love folks like that because they keep things. And if you keep things they, that have meaning, historical value, then it ends up in an archive. And that's great news for us in the archives. Um, and the other thing he was, was a recorder of, of notes. He took meticulous notes throughout his service in the military. And he really recorded almost memoir level memories of some of his most important battles in the air over Europe. And so that's gonna be a big part of what we talk about tonight because it's some really vivid stuff. And I'm so grateful he wrote it down. Um, and then after the war, he came and ended up settling in Dallas and he ended up being a, a lawyer and a philanthropist. Um, he had three daughters. Uh, I, I think they're on the call tonight. I'm so honored that they're joining us and they worked together to donate this collection to the museum. Um, as Sarah shared in some detail, his life, early life in North Dakota, we have one picture from that time. Um, here's a, some family members in North Dakota. This is from the, the 1930s. Um, I, I included this really cool clipping. Um, this is a, a clipping showing a couple of students representing a di diverse group of religious um, student groups. And so Harold Pullman is representing Hillel, um, a Jewish youth group. Um, and I thought that was interesting. They're all, you know, kind of representing their different religious groups and he's there um, representing Hillel. I'm going to jump forward to basic training. He kept just everything you can imagine from his time in basic training. Um, one of the most interesting things to me about the United States mobilization to go to war is this concept of really young guys from all over the United States, from every con conceivable background, every conceivable level of education and economic um, status um, coming together and, and really mobilizing to go across the ocean, either to the European or Pacific theater and encounter some really serious fighting that of course from, if you're in Britain, had been underway for a couple of years by the time we showed up. Um, and so for Harold, he was from North Dakota. He had lived a pretty adventurous, I think we can say life, um, working with his father every day in the fur trade. Um, but you can tell by the things he kept from his basic training that he took it very seriously. He was invested and he was eager to learn every single thing. He took amazing notes. He was very excited to become a radio operator, very excited to become part of the Army Air, Air Forces. 
and it's beautiful what he kept. So let me share some of that. First of all, look at him. I just, he's adorable and he's so young. I am, you know, I'm inching, let's be generous and say towards middle age. Um, but even before that was true, I've always been shocked to think about how young our liberators were. Um, so he looks to my eyes like he might be 15. Of course he wasn't, he was in his twenties. Um, but it's just astonishing to consider that these guys marched off to war in their early twenties um, or late teens. And they knew what they were doing. They knew who they were fighting and they knew it mattered. They knew what they were up against. Um, and it was just with a, a great deal of bravery. And um, I think it's remarkable, but I also think he's just awfully cute. <laughs> um, we have a really um, interesting album and I couldn't share all of it with you because we could spend the whole hour flipping through it. Um, but I, I took one snapshot of it. Uh, this is actually a high resolution scan, but um, this is one of his hand inscribed album pages. And here are some platoon exercises from basic training. And so in the upper left hand corner, it says platoon deployment march. And he is the left skirmishes leader. So Pullman left skirmishes leader in this upper left hand corner. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. You can kind of get a sense of basic training, how things were going. It must have been exciting, but also daunting, I can imagine. Um, here we get, this is a small snapshot of, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of meticulous notes taken by Harold in basic training. He was training to become a um, radio operator, very technical, um, hard to imagine how technical some of you'll see I included some hand-drawn notes of the actual mechanical um, operations of the radios he was going to be in charge of um, and he was very serious academically he went on to law school at UT but even before that he was eager to learn and it was obvious um, he studied 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 and you can tell um, you know, if I was sending my kid off to school, I would want him to um, teach my kid how to study. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so here's some of those amazing hand-drawn notes. There's lots of these in the collection. And I'm sorry, there's a little typo in the middle. I, I copied and pasted Muldorf in there. I didn't mean to, but that's not in the original. That's, a, that's an error from my, from my part. Um, but here you can see he's illustrating some circuitry of some kind. I'm going to go ahead and admit that this goes right over my head. I'm not technically gifted, um, but this, in my view, is bananas. Um, and he's trying to understand. And one thing that is clear and that he would have understood is for our uh, liberators and our soldiers and our Army, Army Air Force, if something went wrong, and this is reflected in his um, memoirs of his um, bombing campaigns, this is reflected. If something went wrong, you had to solve it yourself. So he's trying to be very prepared for that eventuality um, and to understand the equipment that would, would be under his charge. Um, I don't understand it, and it's a good thing that no one expects me to, let's put it that way. Okay, so this is uh, records of Harold's flight examinations. Um, and then I've included this because I'd not seen this in living color, um, but this is a chart of all the chemical agents that our GIs might be expecting to encounter in the field and how they might recognize each chemical agent and what their options for um, treating those chemical agents might be. Um, I was surprised, it's a little hard to read, the typeface or the type is really faded on the original. A lot of, um, a lot of printed material from the 1940s because it was rationed to war times and 
um, the printing and, and ink being used was of low quality, um, is it fades and, and starts to have um, preservation challenges pretty quickly. So this is a faded document, but it's hard to read. But I was surprised at how many different chemical agents there were um, and that RGIs would have uh, been expected to review this document and, and be prepared to react or have a plan if they encountered it in the field. And also good job, Harold, for saving it. I love it. Um, now this is an amazing picture to me um, because this, in, in Harold's collection, and you'll see this uh, up close and personal in this presentation, there is a ton of gear for high altitude flying. And so it's fur lined, it's heavy leather, it's made to protect the flight crew at high altitude and very low temperature. But basic training, as you can see, was in Yuma, Arizona. And so this photo is inscribed saying that it was 136 degrees when this photo was taken. So they put these poor guys in training and threw them out there with the most intense low altitude, I mean, high altitude, low temperature gear and put them in Arizona. And so the juxtaposition caught Pullman, Pullman's attention and it caught my attention too. It's a, it's a great photo and a great inscription. So this is an interesting um, document. Uh, there's some statistics I'm going to share with you later that are heartbreaking, which are that for the Army Air Corps and then the Royal Air Force, so Britain's um, counterpart to the Army Air Force, I'm sorry, Army, Army Air Corps switched to being the Army Air Force um, in 1941. For both of those units, a huge number of casualties, and losses occurred during training um, for obvious reasons, uh, equipment failure, um, human error. Um, we're talking thousands of deaths, thousands of wrecks, thousands of losses. And of course, you know, it, it's heartbreaking on a, many levels. Any, any death in service is heartbreaking. But of course, it would have been a double dose of loss because you you wouldn't have died fighting the enemy and that was preferable. Um, so this was caught my attention because um, Harold uh, was rescuing, was, was put on, um, I'm sorry, one moment. He, he needed replacement gear because he rescued a fellow airman during a bomber crash during training. And so the next document in the collection is saying that he needs 14 days of r and &R because he was injured during that rescue. So that's a fairly substantial injury to need um, that much r and &R. Um, And that shows that that was a pretty serious encounter. Now we're gonna jump into uh, the actual missions he flew. He flew 52 missions um, that is more than average. Uh, you know, the average is around 40, 45 missions. Um, and the, the potential for loss of life or ending up in a POW camp or something worse was immense. Every single mission you flew increased the likelihood of a negative outcome. And so flying 52 missions was a ton of missions. And as you'll find out as we reveal some of these uh, really amazing encounters that Harold has during his war efforts, you'll see he has some amazing close calls. I mean, you really could not make this stuff up. It's the stuff that movie scripts are made of. It's really incredible. Um, so let's just jump right into it. This is one of the photos from the collection I wanted to share with you. Here he is in Europe. I think it's a really fun picture. A couple of GIs out on the town in Europe. Must have seemed pretty um, exotic. Um, here's Harold and one of his buddies. It says it's Bob and I in, in Bari, Italy in February of 1945. 
Um, here is the statistics I was referring to that really gets down to the, the, the meat of the matter. One thing that struck me when I was reading about the US Army Air Forces and the British Ar uh, Royal Air Force, you know, Wright took flight in 1903. And so the Army Air Forces incorporated in 1941, the Army Air Corps came together in 1926. So we're talking 35 years of, of, of Air, Air Force activity. And really it, it was not an active component for a lot of those years. And so the fact that we mobilized tens of thousands of planes and hundreds of thousands of Army, Army Air Force uh, members is an amazing feat. Um, the cost of that, however, um, I'm just going to read this. Um, the U.S. suffered 52,000 aircrew combat losses, and then another 25,000 died in accidents. Um, the U.S. lost 65,000 planes during the war, but only 22,000 of those in combat. And so, yeah, again, half of those were due to accidents. Um, and then just to show you the British Royal Air Force, it says during the whole war, 51% of air crew were killed on operations, 12% were killed or wounded in non-operational accidents, and 13% were prisoners of war. And only 24% survived the war unscathed. So that really tells you um, the risk that these guys were taking. Um, so just a moment to talk about the equipment that Harold was flying in. Um, he spent most of the war on a B-24. Um, ironically, that bomber was called the Liberator. Um, so I, I kind of thought that was interesting. Um, the, it's fun to read about the B-24. I'm not a, a military historian and I'm not a, um, a military equipment buff in any stretch of the imagination. Um, but what's interesting is that the it, it seems like the armed forces powers that be loved the B-24 and the flight crews uh, really <laughs> struggled with the B-24. Um, so this says on high altitude missions, the Liberator had a maximum range of 1600 miles, which was greater than the B-17 but it could only go up to 28,000 feet. Um, so the B-24 had greater risk to anti-aircraft artillery and was vulnerable to damage. And a big problem was that it had a lot of leaking fuel system issues. And so uh, flight crews were just constantly concerned about having an, an explosion due to leaking fuel systems. Um, however, the Air Force relied on them because they could go longer and further and they used them for the most difficult targets throughout the European theater. And it was used in the Pacific theater as well. Um, I, this article, this clipping is from the Pullman collection. Um, and so they, this, this headline says the Liberator or the B-24 was called the bad penny because it always ends up home. And when I read some of these snippets from Harold's writings, it's amazing to hear the kind of damage that could befall these planes and they would keep flying. I, I, to me, I don't understand how these planes that could be so damaged. And you can even see some of the damage that's happened to these planes here. And then the, the flight crews are able to land them. I, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Now, that being said, plenty of them, you know, were crashed or crashed or the flight crews had to parachute out of them behind enemy lines. Um, plenty of flight crews ended up in POW camps or worse. My grandfather was one of them. My grandfather spent the war in a um, 
in a POW camp in Germany. He was in one of these planes. So that was uh, the fate of many of our GIs. Um, however, it's amazing to me what these planes could take and still keep flying. It's really astonishing. So with that, I'm gonna talk about what it was like to be in one of these bombers. Um, Harold spent uh, countless hours of the war in a B-24 and he took these amazing, um, he reflected on his flight missions and he took these notes and really his, his memories or his, his reflections of each mission and he wrote them down. Some of the, some of the, Memories are very brief, one paragraph. Some are three or four pages long, and some of them are really intense. Um, I'm gonna read a few excerpts. Um, some of them are just amazing. So I'm just gonna let Harold's words tell you the story. So here's the first excerpt. Uh, Ellis John, the left waist gunner put the mask on him and opened the emergency valve and he came to. He had passed out. Prior to the target, the bombardier asked for a test opening of the bomb bays. They did not open. The engineer went down to open them with the crank. We were at 24,500 feet. He passed out trying to plug in his mask in the bomb bay oxygen hose. The co-pilot noticed him laying near the open bomb bays and started after him. We were flying in formation. The pilot left the plane on automatic pilot and revived the co-pilot and then revived the engineer. Returning, we flew with two formations of B-17s. We flew to the west of them and over Udine, the flak hit the 17s and two of them fell off. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine you're in a crew, you're in a, formation of B-24s and B-17s. You look around, you're with eight or nine other guys. You look around and you've realized that from what I'm reading here, three of your fellow uh, crew members have passed out. You're at 24,000 square I mean, uh, feet in the air. And then boom, 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 eventually the pilot ends up trying to revive your uh, fellow crew members. It's just, I, I, I don't even, I can't even quite imagine. I, I have to take a moment and reflect that when it's, when I'm flying and there's a little turbulence, I'm just a wreck, you know, but I guess that's why I'm not a uh, B-24 crew member. So, you know, okay. The next excerpt. So, um, Flak, just uh, for those of you who don't know that, that means they're taking fire, direct hits. Um, and he, re he refers to it as either accurate or not accurate. So accurate means, you know, they're taking, they're getting holes in their plane. Um, flak, very, very heavy and accurate. Flak through the bomb bays and it cut the rudder, control cables. Flak through Martin upper turret, shattering the plexiglass of which one piece cut the engineer while falling. Flak hit the co-pilot's heated suit socket and cut off his electric supply for the suit. 13 flak holes in the ship. So basically they've taken heavy flak and their aircraft has 13 holes in it, including two direct hits to the actual person of his fellow crew members. Um, I mean, I d that just sounds absolutely terrifying. Uh, this next um, is a pretty lengthy um, description, but it's simply fascinating. So I'm gonna take the time to read it to you. The first dive over the enemy had started generating smoke. The second time, we were going strong. Now the anti-aircraft gunners had our axis of attack, our altitude, our speed, plus their smoke generators had laid a fog over the area. And instead of changing course, altitude, and speed, we continued exactly the same as the first two runs. So just let me take a moment to say the uh, formation of B-24s were taking a pass 
over a bombing target and they hadn't dropped their bomb loads. They had averted and had taken a second turn and were gone back for a second time. They still hadn't dropped the bomb loads. They couldn't make a clear drop. So they'd gone back a final third time before making the drop of the bombs. Um, but instead of changing course or speed or altitude, they kept making the same um, cycle over the over the the same pathway. I'm sorry. Um, and obviously, Harold thinks that's a mistake, and he was right. <laughs> um, and so the anti-aircraft gunners knew where they were coming, where they're coming from. They knew their altitude, their speed. Um, so Harold says, the boys below were ready for us. The flak was terrific. It rumbled under us like thunder. I saw red A and red O with number one and number four both on fire. Number one and number four refer to engines. They peeled off and started down. Later, red A is said to have exploded with nine chutes leaking. So nine crew members are bailing out. Red A is in Hungary and the crew is coming back. So he's heard that the crew is making their way back. Two bombs did not release as they were frozen to the shackles. So two bombs underneath their uh, airplane didn't come loose. And so they are stuck to the airplane with ice. Um, they went, one bomb broke loose and went through the bomb bay door, causing it to dangle and drag from the plane. The other three doors would not close, causing terrific drag on the plane. Number four was on fire, having been, fit, having been hit. The fire went out. The drag on the ship caused us to burn 300 gallons an hour, so we were low on fuel. We decided to put down on a landing strip 18 miles behind German lines in Yugoslavia, which our boys had just built three weeks before. However, we were worried that the bomb might release over friendly territory and injure Yugoslavians. So we flew out over the Adriatic at altitude and lowered down to below freezing temperature where the bomb was kicked out. Then we looked for the strip. We found it when we saw a plane burning below and circled and landed. So essentially this is how Harold Pullman and his crew end up behind German lines in Yugoslavia. Um, I mean, the description of how this all happens, I just think is astonishing. And they end up making it out okay. Um, believe it or not, they spend the night, they repair the plane, which is hard to fathom, and then they fly out of there. Um, just amazing. So a few other little snippets. Um, this, uh, this grabbed my attention because he mentions taking, this is another flight, taking direct flat, flak over Graz. And I just put that in there because I used to live there. Um, so that's really interesting to imagine um, Harold Pullman flying in B-24s over the town I used to live in in Austria. Um, then there's another little quote I put in about the German flak was really accurate because they shot from 12,000 feet high in the mountains. So, you know, he's flying at 12,000 feet, but the Germans are right at eye level. Um, it's interesting to think about. Um, and then he mentions that he, they went on a really long mission, the longest anyone could remember going to Prague, so nine hours and 10 minutes. And so then you can see the benefit of that uh, B-24, the longer um, flight time that it could tolerate. Um, I wanted to mention that in his um, writings, he talks about bombing the Muldorf marshalling yard, which is outside of the concentration camp in Muldorf, which was a sub camp of Dachau. Um, and that camp saw slave labor used for aircraft production. Um, which we do want to take a moment to talk about that. There were, um, we know now, uh, 44,000, probably more concentration camps throughout Europe. And a lot of those camps were used for wartime production, including for what would have seen from the allied perspective as um, strategic bombing goals. So obviously um, Harold's flight uh, crew would have seen a um, 
aircraft production facility as a uh, bombing goal, and they in fact did want to bomb it. Um, they were using slave labor there, um, potentially, probably uh, Jewish slave labor in that production. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, there are some really unique aerial photographs included in this collection. I just included a couple of them um, to get a sense of what Harold would have seen from the sky. Um, this is a Porto Novo marshalling yards in Verona, Italy. This is actually of Muldorf, Germany, that um, where that concentration camp would have been. This is outside of Amstetten, Austria. And then this is actually showing some bomb hit sites outside of Regensburg. So I just uh, included this um, to show where Muldorf would, uh, is uh, in relative to other concentration camps and industrial sites. And here's a picture of um, forced laborers building um, this satellite camp of Dachau and Muldorf. And as the war continued on and as Allied bombing offensives um, tackled, I guess, um, strategic bombing of, of aircraft facilities and other um, war effort um, factories, um, the Germans moved some of these sites underground. So what you see is really an, an underground facility for wartime production being outfitted or constructed by slave labor. So um, back to Harold's service. Uh, here's Harold getting a lot of honor and an air air medal and Air Force patch um, for all of his services. He ended up being shot down a total of three times. Um, having read those excerpts, I, I think you can imagine that over the course of 52 missions, it's really uh, honestly amazing to me. He was only shot down three times, having encountered so much anti-aircraft artillery being sent really all over Europe. He ends up going all through Italy and Germany, obviously Yugoslavia, Eastern Europe. He's, he's sent really all over um, in these bombing missions and encounters a, a huge amount of resistance um, and faces a lot of peril and uh, serves honorably throughout. I wanted to read this. This is included in Pullman's collection. It's a, a summary of the uh, 15th Air Force and their efforts. Eight out of every 10 bombs dropped during the war by the 15th Air Force fell within 2,000 feet of the target center. Major General Jay Bevins, commanding general of the Army Air Force in the Mediterranean Theater, revealed this week. Over six of every 10 bombs released by the 15th four injured bombers came within 1,000 feet of the point of intended impact. Of the 242,000 sorties flown by the 15th, 80% were effective. Bad weather being responsible for 10% of the non-effective flights. And I'll stop there. Um, in, in the notes that Harold takes after each mission, um, the short entries are always basically some summary saying, we got up at 345, we mustered at 515, and they sent us back because of bad weather. And you can usually tell that he's he's disappointed to not be able to, to make the mission happen. Or even, even more, I think, frustrating, they would actually be in the air on routes and see that weather was going to preclude them making the drop of the bombs. And that was very frustrating. So um, now finally, last bit of really kind of fascinating fun. Um, before I run out of time, I want to show you some of the really cool stuff that came in with this collection. It was really exciting for us to work with. Unfortunately, um, our assistant archivist is a textile expert and really did a lot of work with these cool textiles and our, um, our, our wonderful um, um, 
Jeanette Albert in turn did a lot of work to rehouse these. So let me show you this cool stuff. I'm gonna introduce these with a wonderful clipping that comes from a newspaper from North Dakota. So this is really fun. This is a clipping, um, which is a reprint of a letter that um, Harold Pullman sent to his parents um, describing the um, get up that you had to don to be able to fly at high altitude. Oh, let me see here. So, trousers, shirt, over the shirt, a wool sweater, over this, an electric heating unit to be plugged into the plane, over this, woolen coverall coveralls, one pair fur lined pants, one fur lined jacket. A rubber May West, which inflates and keeps one afloat when ditching in water. A parachute, bedroom slipper-like felt shoes, electrically lined heated stocking, heavy fur-lined boots, electrically heated gloves over silk gloves, a heavy steel jacket and steel helmet for wearing 20 minutes before reaching the target to stop some of the flack. Strapped to his belt, a 45 caliber pistol, a trench knife, a first aid kit, pair of GI shoes for hiking over rough enemy terrain in case of forced landing. Cor uh, Corporal Pullman told his parents, so on Easter Sunday, the B-24 Easter rabbit delivers his Easter eggs. And what he's meaning is bombs. Um, and so that I felt was a great way to introduce the incredible um, textiles and equipment that was donated with this collection, which is really astonishing to see, and honestly took us a, a little bit to understand what each of these implements was. Um, so this is that silk electric jacket, um, which is really uh, a, a, an intense piece of equipment, basically a heated blanket in jacket form. Um, here is a set of headphones, um, which of course as a radio operator would have been um, pretty uh, useful, <laughs> required. Here is a really uh, beautiful helmet. It's fur lined. Here's a, you know, his, uh, his wool um, uniform with his medals and stripes. And then these are really impressive um, fur lined boots uh, with plastic soles, and I mean, they're quite a piece of engineering in and of themselves. And then finally, um, the coming home. Um, this I thought was pretty interesting bit of um, memorabilia, um, a reentry pamphlet, instructions on how to, um, to come home, reminders on don't be late, don't miss the bus essentially, um, and don't don't get, go AWOL when you're almost home. Um, and then I included this uh, just as a reminder that a lot of our GIs graduated after they served. And so here's um, um, university graduation for um, Harold from the University of North Dakota. And then Harold turned his attention to establishing his family. He met his lovely wife at the University of Texas where she was attending school to become a specialist in early education. Harold was attending law school there. They were married in 1950 and spent 62 happy years together. They went on to have three children who settled in the North Texas area. And then just a mention of some further reading, there's some really you know, the great thing about these um, these flight crews is a lot of them had reunions and really did a lot to preserve their um, legacy. And luckily, Harold did a great job of that. And his daughters preserved his memory by and his legacy by donating the collection. All of these records that we've talked about tonight are available on our website and I invite you to spend some time looking at that. Um, and please ask any questions. Um, and you can read more about the Army Air Force on the National Archives. And there's a lot of information about various bombardment groups, including records of each bombing campaign and mission that the bombardment groups went through. Um, with that, I think we can open it up to some questions and I'll stop sharing.
So Felicia, we got a, we have a question here um, uh, from from one of the audience members. Uh, they want to know if it's rare to see a collection that's this extensive, or to see a, one individual keep so many important items <laughs> and together from this time. I would say, well, of course, you know, we're we're not we don't tend to get traditionally that many World War II collections. I'm sure World War II Museum has other collections of similar nature. For me, it's unique to have a collection that has photos, written documentary evidence, so primary source written by the individual that's this extensive. So it's rare to have someone that in real time sits down, records what's happening. If you think about it, not that many people do that. So the fact that he came home after each flight mission and recorded exactly what happened in his own words and kept that, that to me is the most significant part of this collection. And then on top of that, we have all the, and we didn't include even a really, a, a, the, we didn't include that many of the objects. We have a huge number of objects that he kept. So I would say it is rare and unique to have that full breadth of everything. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, Bella Garber wants to know, how did Harold end up in Dallas? Do you, do you know I that? Do, I oh. do know that. Um, so he was in the Dakotas and there was interest in, um, there was burgeoning interest in oil leases and he kind of sniffed around property rights law related to oil leases and he figured out that he needed to learn the legal side of property law relating to oil leasing. I'm not getting this 100% right. I'm almost there, I think. And he figured out that he needed to go to UT because Texas was, you know, on top of that, let's put it that way, for reasons that make lots of sense. And so when he went to UT, he got, he studied up on real estate and oil leases and then ended up settling in Dallas um, after going to UT. And I'm sure I missed some steps in there, but that's basically what I can remember of it. <laughs> okay. um, Francis Lutner, uh, excuse me, Francis Lutmer asked an interesting question. Was there any issue with this level of documentation that was considered classified or risk to mission security? May I, may I, may I? Go for it. The answer is yes. So Francis, it is a terrific question. And it is a question that went through both Felicia's and my minds as we were reviewing the collection when it uh, first came in and then subsequently when we were cataloging it. And the answer is that Mr. Pullman, in addition to uh, being, an, as a historian, he's a man after my own heart, he keeps records. So in addition to being a record keeper, um, was a record keeper of things that he was not allowed to keep, I think would be a way to, to phrase this. So, so he wasn't supposed to, to keep uh, those kinds of extensive journals and diaries and then take them with him when he, when he left the service. Um, a lot of his uh, photographs, so the photographic intelligence that he had before he would go out as a navigator on one of these, on one of these uh, B-24 um, flights. Again, that wasn't supposed to leave the surface with him. So he just, he, he used it, he kept it. And so we're the beneficiaries of the fact that um, he, it wasn't strictly legal what he did. Um, now, having said that, thank God people do do these kinds of things, because I would, I would argue that a lot of World War II collections are based upon this type of material, not as extensive as this is, but bits and pieces that people that people thankfully for historians and for archivists kept so that we can then recreate stories and, 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 and really tell more of, mm -hmm. of, of what happened during this era, you know, from a kind of a, a first person perspective. So, so we're very lucky. That he yeah, and at this point, a lot of this has been published online by the bombardment groups and the Air Force themselves. 
so you know at this point it's 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 fairly moot point but yeah <laughs> you know i don't think i don't think his commander would have been thrilled with the aerial photos being floating around at the time. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> um, Felicia, Victoria Maddox, uh, it's, it's more in the nature of a comment. Um, and and I, I, I've never met her, but she's come to a number of our um, programs, particularly the, the archive programs. And she says that she is actually tracking and researching two brothers who were slave laborers in Muldorf. Really? Uh, they were building the Messerschmitt uh, 262 there. Huh. And one of the brothers survived. So she just is excited that she stumbled across this connection to her research. And that's why these programs are so important because they enable oh. people to make these kinds of connections. I think that's wonderful. How interesting. And then another question, this is Michael Kotwitz. And he would like to know uh, what you think is the most interesting piece or pieces in this particular collection. So in the Pullman collection. Yeah, the, I mean, for me, that's easy. That's the, the mission flight logs. Um, so the excerpts that I read, um, you know, I, I transcribed them. Um, I can show you what they look like. Um, so this is a this is a printout of a scan, but you know basically every flight mission or um, mission, um, there are 52 flights that he uh, mission bombing missions. I'm sorry, um, that that Pullman's crew went on. He would come back and record exactly what happened, and 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 I I excerpted four of them, but when I tell you, I mean you know if you've watched Band of Brothers or any of those types of documentary series, uh, you know, this could have been an episode. <laughs> um, the drama is right there for you. You don't have to look very hard. So to me, even though the three-dimensional objects as a museum, of course, are significant for us and very valuable um, and meaningful, for me, that's the most interesting. And I think for Sarah, I, I don't know what you think, I, um, that's the most significant um, and telling. So uh, for me, the most interesting part of all of this, and, and this is just my historical background, um, was the fact that the Poland, the Poland family settled in North Dakota. Yeah. The Russian Jews who came, who came to the U.S. and landed in New York, looked around New York and said, there's land out in North Dakota. That's what, that's what uh, Paul Pullman said. And, and out he and Sally went. And that the guts that that takes, to my mind, is really, really incredible. Um, and that, that, knowing that background and then Harold's lifelong connection to the North Dakota uh, Jewish community, even though it was small, he, he, was, he, was, he was engaged with it, he gave contributions to it throughout his life, that really kind of energized me as much as then kind of learning mm -hmm. about, you know, his World War II uh, connections. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to uh, thank everybody so much for joining us. Uh, I wanted to also uh, suggest if you're interested uh, in learning more about the Pullman collection, please go online to our website uh, and uh, feel free to explore that way through the research archive section or uh, to connect uh, or, or contact Felicia. Um, if you're interested in the Jewish communities of North Dakota, please feel free to travel to Minnesota because <laughs> the records of many of the North Dakota Jewish communities, Devil's Lake, Fargo, um, uh, uh, Grand Forks, are located in, all, of all places, Minneapolis, St. Paul. That's where really? the historical records are kept, yeah. Huh. Um, so, so, uh, it's, it's definitely worth, worth a look at that as well, if that, if that kind of floats your boat. Um, <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And I also wanted to thank the three Pullman, uh, uh, sisters so very much for having entrusted us, uh, with your father's collection. Uh, we hope to do much, much more with it for the public uh, over the years. And we hope that this is, and I actually, I'm sure that this is just the beginning of our exploration. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Felicia, if okay with you, I think I'll offer to, uh, we can send links to those resources on your last slide to everyone who attended tonight. That way you'll have clickable links. Um, you can feel free to explore the collection a little further on our website and some of those other resources. Uh, so we'll send that out tomorrow. But again, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. As always, please feel free to visit our website, dhhrm.org to check out upcoming programs. And we hope to see you soon. Good night, everybody.